Okay. Um, we're going to start going over GUIs uh, today. Um, GUIs have sort of evolved on Java. Um, first, there was what's called AWT, and sometimes we'll still use classes from AWT. Then came Java Swing, which is sort of a bigger, bigger set of tools. And now there's a new tool called Java FX. We're going to cover uh, Java Swing in this class, and we'll see how to create a GUI. Um, a lot of you, kind of from the first day of the class, were, for lack of a better word, concerned by the fact that in our unit test, you have to uh, hard code values in. So if you were testing a student, you had to hard code that Mike was the name, uh, was an in-county resident and took these three courses. All right, keep in mind the unit test is not permanent code. The unit test is exactly that. It's a, it's a, a class to you that's used to test your problem domain class or your business classes, which are they're sometimes called. Um, they're not gonna be part of the application. Um, what's typically, uh, the objects would be connected either to possibly a database to run in the background or a file system or connected to a GUI or all of the above. All right. And so therefore what we're going to do is maybe more like what you would do in a real application. All right. Uh, that is, we're going to create our classes and then call, uh, or, or have a GUI, have a GUI create those classes, set the values based on, uh, values that are entered on this on the screen and then output the results. So let's go over this one. And this one's pretty simple. It allows the entry of the temperature in centigrade, and it displays the value in Fahrenheit. So zero centigrade is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. If I put something that doesn't make sense in, I get an exception that says invalid input. Uh, now that you're coding a GUI, keep in mind that that's something that's sort of out of your control, what the user types in. Therefore, you're gonna very definitely wanna include validation and exception catching in that. All right, let's look to see what we have in this first example, and then we'll go from there. I only have one class, the GUI class. We'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes here. Open it up in Visual Studio Code. And away we go. First of all, notice that we have a few things that we talked about before. We're importing the entire swing package and from AWT, which I mentioned was sort of the first sort of pass of uh, of GUI in uh, Java, we're, we're importing action listener and an action event. All right, so notice these are at the beginning. Notice in this case, our first GUI extends J frame. So it is a J frame, which means that automatically we get all the features that are in J frame, all the properties and methods and so on. All right, and it implements action listener. All right. What that means is this class can serve in the role of action listener. All right, and that's important. Let's look at the action listener interface. One method named action performed that accepts as an argument 
an action event of E, an action event called E. So what that means is this class better have a method called action performed that accepts an action event of E. Could call it anything, not necessarily always E, but it accepts an action event. And there it is. If this were not in here, this would not compile. Let me cut that out for now, save it, and try to recompile. It doesn't compile because we promise that it implements action listener. And when you create an interface, what that means is you promise to implement all the methods that are defined in that interface. So with this, with this not in there, uh, we get an error. If I don't do this, if I don't extend JFrame, We get errors because we're setting some properties that exist uh, in this that are not defined in our class, but are defined in the parent class. Even if it did compile, it wouldn't behave as a JFrame because we didn't inherit from it. So public class GUI extends JFrame, implements action listener. All right. Let's look at how this is set up. I've defined some swing components here. A label, which is simply a label, uh, a read-only field on the screen, something that the user cannot manipulate, equals new J label, and I provide the prompt, enter temperature in centigrade. J text field is a, our J text field is a text box. And because I set the size at four, it's gonna allow the entry of four characters. Just forgot to save it. Well, that's a good question. Let's try it out. Actually, I think I know the answer. I can enter as much as I want. Doesn't even give us an exception. The four is the physical size of it. So if I enter in 99999, it's gonna be really hot. All right. I think it takes the whole thing. It, the four is just more or less a an estimated physical size for that text box. If we, on the screen, yeah. Okay. Here we have a button, a J button called button convert, which is a new button that has the word convert. Convert is simply the name that's gonna be on the button. I'm gonna keep this running. Here's the J label, here's the text box, here's the button called convert. And then finally, we have a label for the results that has just a bunch of spaces in it. And that we see Well, we don't really see it here, but it's there, all right? It's there taking up that amount of space. Bunch of empty strings. Okay, here we're just defining the components. We have to put those components somewhere. And where do we put them? We put them in the constructor of this class. All right? Notice how this works. 
All right. When I compile it, when I go to run it, what does it mean when I go to run a Java program? It means it's looking for the main event. So it's going to look for, not the main event, the main method. So when I type in Java first GUI, it's going to look in first GUI, and it's going to look for the static method, all right? Static means it doesn't require an object. The static method called main. And what does that do? What does the static method do? It calls the first GUI constructor. So now we have an actual J frame is going to appear. All right. We didn't have this in here. Nothing would happen when we typed in main. All right. So we have to call the constructor to create a new instance of the J frame uh, that we've that, that we've extended and called first GUI. So what are we doing? First of all, we're saying we're making the uh, frame visible. All right. How come we didn't say something like this? How come we didn't do that? Well, because we don't never, we, we, we don't never, <laughs> we never would use this variable. We just want to make one of these appear and we don't need a reference to it to do anything. All right. I suppose you could. And if you had some reason to do a reference to it, um, you could do that. Um, but in our case, we don't really need to have a reference for it to do stuff. We need a reference to like call a method or set a property or something like that. All right. We don't do that. We just want it to appear. And therefore we put all the construct all the code in the constructor and it will appear the way that we want it to. So the first thing it does makes it visible. Second thing it does, it sets the default close operation to this operation. All right. That simply means when this program is done running, or rather, what I should say, when I hit the close X to close it, this program exits, or this, this program exits, this object is destroyed. So I do that, boom, we exited the instance of that program, and the object associated with it, with it is destroyed. We're going to save this one for a minute because this is a big one. All right. Now, we've created these components, but unless we do this, those things are not going to appear in the frame. All right. We have these components created and they're sort of sitting out in space, they're sitting out in memory. We have to attach those things to a window, all right? So, or more specifically, a frame. How do we do that? By saying jpanel. A jpanel is a collection of a bunch of components, all right? So it's sort of a, 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 a pardon me, like a window, sort of a window inside of a frame. All right, the only difference is you can actually have multiple windows inside a frame. All right, so we create this J panel and we, we're gonna forget about this for now. We're going to add all those to that J panel. So now we add the, the label, we add the text box, we add the button and we add the result label to the panel. Then we say, add this panel to the frame. 
all right? Usually there's going to be one main panel that you have. And that panel itself can contain other panels. If you had a section, for example, if you had a section of an application to log on and on the same screen you had to register for a new account. You might have one panel that has the logon information and another panel that has the register information on it. And then we set the size at this. Now, this is one thing I guarantee is gonna frustrate you, all right? Because it frustrates me and we'll definitely talk about the sum, but we're not necessarily gonna be obsessed with it. When we add these things to the panel, how does it add it? Well, by default, if we don't say anything about the layout of it, it's going to lay them out horizontally inside the panel. So we didn't specify where the label goes and where the text box goes, where the button goes, or anything about the layout. Therefore, it adds it to the panel horizontally. And it's gonna, this one just takes the defaults. It will display it as being centered within the frame and it makes it 800 wide by 100 tall because that's what we said there. Now let's play with this. I don't do this. Pardon me? Right. There is an event listener. We'll, we'll get to that in a, in a second. If I go in and comment that out, what's going to happen? It runs, but there's no button in there. Why? because we didn't put the button on the panel. So that button object exists. It's just not being displayed on any screen, all right? Which makes it sort of hard to click, all right? If we, we don't do this, what do you think is gonna happen? It's gonna be empty because we put all those things on the panel but we never said that the panel goes inside the frame. Sure enough, that's what we get. Okay, so to put things on your frame, and in the case of a simple GUI, you need to put the stuff on a panel, put the panel inside the frame, all right? Stuff being the different components on the form. Label, text field, button, and label in this example. Now I said a label is a read only. That's not really true. Uh, it's read only from the user's perspective. Our code can access it and change it and modify it. Uh, it's just that the user can't change the value of the label. Does everyone have the displaying of the form down? Think you understand it? Questions? Yes. That's a, that's a function. This is sort of like using a dot notation to string functions together. Let's look at what get content pane returns. Yep. What does get content pane do exactly? Why do, why do I get the feeling that uh, so many of these things in uh, Stack Overflow are like students frantically completing a final exam. <laughs> and the question was, is what, you know, what does get content frame do? Line of code, difficult to understand, blah, 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 blah. Too long, didn't read. All right. Yep. 
Yeah, let's. Yeah. On the class J frame, which our thing is, there's a method called get content pane. And what does that return? That returns a container. What is a container? A container is things that we can put other things in. One of the methods for that is add. And the add can accept any component. In JPanel, is inherited from component. So we could put a J panel in the container that every window has, every frame has. I wanna say window, but strictly speaking, there, there are frames, okay? If I look at J frame, Oh, it doesn't show any of the actual field summary. There's a root pane. All right. Okay, so that's what this does. This takes the panel that we created, which is a component. All right. It's a component that itself contains other components. It uh, adds it to a panel. And that panel, then it makes the main, the frames main content pane, the, the main stuff inside of our frame that we created. All right. So that gets the, the, that gets the, uh, window displayed. Now, if we didn't have this in here, would have the button would add the button to the application. However, nothing would happen when we press the button. Nothing happens. Why not? Because no one is waiting for that button to be pressed. And the term for this is a listener. There's no listeners defined for that button. Why not? Because we commented it, commented it out. All right. So what does this do? This says for this button, make this object, whatever this object is, make it the piece of code that handles when that button gets clicked. All right. So we're assigning this object to be the one that acts that, that gets accessed when that button, when we do some action with that button. And in this case, the action on a button is to click the button. All right. Now, can we put any object in here? Can we put, I don't know, some other object? I just create an integer and say, that's the object that handles this. And the answer is, as you might imagine, no. Well, it takes what? Let's look up in the documentation. It's a couple button. Let's see exactly what that.
expects. These documentation, again, get used to reading them because they, they're not like good to serve as a tutorial, but they tell you exactly what's going on. All right. Add action listener. Does it exist on this class? So it must exist on the abstract button, maybe? That's the field. Let's see. Here we go, methods. Add action listener. Is looking for an action listener. All right. Therefore, whatever class we give it, it has to be an action listener. Would this work? would but actually it won't do that because the action listener is an interface so we couldn't do that so whatever we give this function has to be an action listener guess what our first GUI object itself implements action listener therefore I'm allowed to say this here the only reason I can say this here is because this object is an action listener because it implements the action listener interface. Now, what's the method that an action listener has? Action performed. So we make sure we put in this code, we put in this method, the code that we want executed when the button is pressed. If we eliminate this, we already saw that. We'll get a compiler because this doesn't contain that add uh, or action performed. So what this does is this says that this button, when you click it, is going to call the action perform method on this class. All right which is right here. Why well, declare a double for C, a double for F. I parse the text box, because remember, a text box can literally contain any kind of text, all right? So I have to make sure it's actually a double. I do this math, and then I set the text of the label to be the answer, how many degrees Fahrenheit it is. If there's any exception, I say invalid input. All right, which when you look at this, about the only thing that could go wrong with this is if this was not something that you could parse to a double. So if I enter in a number there and I do parse double, yeah, a number can be parsed as a double. If I enter a word there, no, the letters can't be parsed to a double and therefore it throws an exception. Well, let's see. We don't enter anything in there. Gives us invalid input. Why? Because it can't parse an empty string into a double. All right. Now, this is something that you might show to a user, right? Um, invalid input. Because we look at this code and know that's the only thing that could go wrong. We're not dividing by zero. We don't have any real objects in there. Um, I suppose this could be null if we forgot to create it, but that would be an obvious bug that hopefully would catch by then. So we pretty much know. What if we wanted to see the precise exception instead of the words invalid input? We could say ex.toString. 
That's all right. We could say EX to strain. And then we'll get the actual exception that gets thrown. Number format exception, empty string. All right, we type in garbage in there. Tells us number format exception for input string that. Now, a good rule of thumb is when you're developing code, it's good to have descriptive error messages. You don't always want to display descriptive error messages to the user then for a couple reasons. First of all, um, would a user understand what this means? Maybe, I don't know, maybe not. Certainly some other exceptions would be very difficult for a user to understand. Therefore, we're gonna simplify it and express the errors in user-friendly uh, ways. All right. Now, in some cases, especially web apps, displaying an error message can give information that can be used by people to infiltrate the system. Therefore, you would not want to display a descriptive error message that delved into displaying something about your database or connecting to your database or something like that. So because of that, what you could do is something like this. Have this in there for testing in the source code. And have the actual error message be this. Now, you have to remember when this went live, though, to comment that out. All right. You could probably do something like have a global object that had whether you were in production or uh, testing mode and then decide based on that uh, some static variable in a static object, whether you're in produ uh, production or testing mode and display the appropriate error message if you really wanted to. Question? Right, the main method, we're running this GUI, all right? So we wouldn't have to have the run statement in the GUI, or, or, or the, the, I'm sorry, the, not the run statement, the main method in the GUI, but we have it just so that conveniently we can just run this guy anytime we want, all right? And just by running the GUI, it runs this, and what it does is then it calls the constructor, which sets up and displays the window, and then it has an action performed for when the window, when the button gets pressed. I could have another one, you know, I could have a start program class that all it would do is create an instance of this and the same thing would happen. There really wouldn't be any benefit of creating an extra object or an extra class just for that though. All right, so I'm gonna combine the main method in here. Now, that's one way to do this. There's another way that you can do this. There's probably three different ways to do it. And we'll talk about, we'll show you two of them and we'll talk about a third. This one, if my memory serves, does the exact same thing. It's just internally, the code is a little different. Oh, I lied. There's actually two buttons here. And we can type in temperature, go C to F. 
or F to C, and it shows you the result. Okay, so if we think about this for a second, since this guy has two buttons, it might be tricky to use one action listener. We could do it, but that action listener would have to figure out which button got pressed. And some, we, somehow we wanna keep our code a little cleaner than that, a little more straightforward. So we're gonna create two action listeners. Notice what we have here, our JFrame doesn't implement the action listener class. This actually shows both the methods, all right? One is by the use of what's called an internal class. And the rest of it is about the same, except we have two buttons, all right? And our two buttons, we give each of them an action listener. Where was that code at? Oh, up here. For the first button, for the centigrade to Fahrenheit, we add a listener that is a new instance of C to F. Well, if you looked at the code, you didn't see any C to F in here. That's because it's a class defined inside of another class. So I have actually two class definitions inside this one Java file. And it implements action listener which is cool. It has the action perform method, which is cool. And it does its thing. Now, because it's contained in this class, it's before the end of the class, it can access all the global variables for its parent class. So it can access the txt temp, which is defined as a instance-based variable. No, yes. No, it's not a subclass. Doesn't inherit from anything. It does implement action listener. That's the only requirement. But the class definition itself is physically contained within there. Therefore, it can access all of the attributes of that. So this is called, I think, an internal class. If you notice what it compiles to, it compiles this dollar sign and then the name of the class, C2F, which is this guy here. Now that's also acceptable. It's acceptable to have this class inside the class because we're never gonna use this button action listener on any other class. This is written specifically for this frame, all right? If we were to use it on another frame, we'd have to write it for that frame, all right? We're not interested in reusing this function. Therefore, it's okay if it exists inside of this class. Well, it has a benefit of that is you could have several action listers. Like in this problem, we need two of them. We need one for the one button, one for the other one. So we create, yeah. If I had, if I implemented action listener here, I'd have one action perform method that would have to be smart enough to split between you click this button or you click that, that, that button. It's possible to do it, but it kind of makes the code a little messier. All right. Now here's the other way, and this is called an anonymous class. And this is a little confusing. I define inside of the parenthesis a new action listener that contains in it this function. So I actually have in here sort of a little mini class definition. 
The only difference between this and that is here we've given the class a name. Here we have not given the class a name, therefore it's called an anonymous class. All right. What is type of it is? It's of type action event. Oh, I'm sorry, action performed. Action listener, I'll get to it eventually. It's a new action listener. All right. And inside that, we put this code in. The advantage of this is it doesn't create like extra classes. It does compile to an inner class. That's why you see this dollar sign one. It just numbers the anonymous classes. A lot of people like to do this because, again, cuts down on a number of classes that you need. So you'll see this a lot. The good news is, is you can do this any way that you want to. All right, you can declare a anonymous class, you can have an inner class, or you can actually implement the interface on the frame itself. Implementing on the frame itself is typically best if you only have one button. These two, I would, I would argue that there's really not much of a difference between the two. I would hope that you'd understand all of them though. Right? Understand what they do, because again, you might be called upon to maintain someone else's code. And if you saw, if you never saw something like this before and had no idea what it is, I imagine it'd be quite confusing. The button is an object, J button. Right. Button object is not an event listener. Button object is a component, I think. It inherits from and inherits from a bunch of things, but it does not uh, implement uh, an act. It does not implement the action listener interface. Now, one other thing we do here, if you notice, our stuff is stacked vertically instead of horizontally. Why is that? Because I've set for this panel a new layout, a new box layout for the panel that the layout is on the Y axis. In other words, it goes vertically before I add these things to it. Then I add the panel and I set the content frame and I set the size and set it visible and I'm ready to go. And we can talk more about these layouts or you can review them. If there's actually uh, several different layouts, there's like the north, south, east, west layout that sort of divides the screen into, uh, what would that be, five areas. The north would be the top area, the south would be the bottom. East and West, okay, maybe four areas. Uh, and if you notice this, This is going to create a new border layout. We're going to add this to the north, add this to the center, add this to the east, put the results in the south. Type in 22 centigrade to Fahrenheit, it displays it there. Now, this is weird since we didn't put anything in the east. No, that would be west. These are all the way over. Getting these layouts correct is a real pain. 
All right, that's one advantage uh, of of using uh, the the other method. Um, what I say it was J. Java FX is that you can actually apply a CSS file, I believe, to a Java FX um, window. Let me double check that to make sure I'm not lying. Yep, it can. Which gives you a lot more choices as far as layout goes. Now, uh, I guarantee it's going to be frustrating for you to work through this. Uh, I'm not terribly picky on how your layouts look as long as functionally it works and it does everything that's required. Now, to preview the homework assignment, I've given you the pizza classes. You can download those classes and use them, create a GUI that will allow you to use uh, those classes. What does that entail? That entails a couple things. Number one, you need to change the way that this action perform method does. And this action perform method all the code here is self contained. What you're going to do is you're going to create an instance of the pizza class. You're going to pull the values from each of your controls and set the properties on that pizza class. You're going to then add it to an order. The order, by the way, should be an instance variable. It should be accessible throughout the class or throughout this class. You're going to create the pizza object, add it to the order, and then call the method to get the bake time and the cost amount of the order and display that on the screen. So you're going to have more code in there than this. It's going to, again, create a pizza, set the properties, add it to an order, and then call the get cost and get bake time method to display that and call it on the order. The order should be defined as an instance variable. Only worry about worry about doing one order. Don't worry about like writing this so you could create a new order or whatever. Just assume that you're creating one order and all the pizzas that you add go on that one order. All right. The other thing that you'll need to change is that a text box isn't adequate for everything. For example, if you're picking whether it's small, medium, or large. Well, if you give a text box, they can type anything in, all right? Well, you might say you could have validation then or throw an exception. Yeah, but it's better still if you don't allow them to enter something that's not right. Look up J radio button. And it will show you a radio button and how to use it. This associates an, an action listener with the radio button, which you can do. In our case, we're not going to associate the radio button with an action listener because you're going to do several things. The action listener is going to be on the button itself. 
when we click it, we're going to get the value from the radio buttons and set those objects. All right. Questions about this? Yes. You don't have to worry about, you, you have to create an, uh, an order object. You don't have to worry about creating multiple order objects. In other words, an actual pizza application would have a start order button. You press that, that would create a new order. You'd go in, you'd process, enter all the information in, then you'd click submit order, and that would go save it in a database or something. And then that would start you with a brand new order object. You don't have to worry about creating a new order object each time. You do have to create a order object, though, that you're going to put all your pieces in. You just, yeah. Well, the order class is created, yeah. If you look here, this is some of the examples that we went over earlier in the semester, but you get You get an or well, I include the unit test too, but the two you're gonna need are the pizza and the order. All right. Uh you're welcome to make changes to them, but you probably don't have to. All right. You could probably do this assignment without making any changes. But if there's something that'll make your life easier, by all means do it. Other questions. All right, that's all I had for today. Um, we'll see you next week. Every time you press the button, the action performed gets executed. No, no, it just does it. Every time you press the button, it, it does the action performed once. So like in this case, if you wanted to add three pizzas, you'd enter the data, hit the button, enter the data, hit the button, enter the data, hit the button. Right, yeah, and you don't need, yeah, exactly.